Good morning, church family. Uh, welcome to those that are here uh, present, and welcome to those who are uh, present online this morning. So it's uh, great to be together, and I uh, look forward to our worship services this morning. Uh, we do have some family news this morning we need to pass on and make everybody aware of. Uh, first thing, it's important that each of us take our communion cups out of the auditorium and dispose of them in the provided trash uh, containers whenever we're uh, finished with our service. Also, thank you to Phil Dixon, Paul Gardner, and Robin Miller for the Christmas decorations up here on the stage during the holidays. So thank you to Phil, Paul, and Robin uh, for taking care of that for us. Uh, in hospital news, this morning, Jonas Hearn fell late last week and had hip replacement surgery on Saturday at Unity Health. Uh, she is expected to be in the hospital at least for a few days. And Edwin Myers had double, double leg amputation below the knees on Saturday. He is in ICU at St. Vincent's Hospital. Please keep Edwin and Mary and all of their family uh, in our prayers. And in sympathy this morning, uh, Doris Biggerstaff, the mother of Linda Hickerson and grandmother of Ashley Lynn, passed away on Friday, November 27th. Doris was a resident at Harding Place and a member of the College Church the past eight years. The family will have a private graveside service, and in lieu of flowers, donations can be made in her honor to Sparrow's Promise on Moore Street. And then this announcement, caring and sharing, will not meet tomorrow night. So caring and sharing will not meet uh, tomorrow night. And then please keep your eye on, on your emails and Facebook for any important updates uh, that will be coming out uh, this week also. And now John Reese has a special announcement. Good morning. I'm uh, here to thank you for the Great Commission Sunday gift. Uh, not just representing my ministry, but also all of the ministries that have been blessed, the ministries and missions. Uh, with the Great Commission Sunday, College Church has certainly added new and more meaning to the thanks in Thanksgiving. We are really grateful when Rick Harper uh, informed me of the outstanding collection, and at that time the total was quite marvelous, but it has grown since then. I sent an email to, back to Rick and said, what a magnificent heart for mission. College Church is amazing. On behalf of the many mission efforts you support, we at World Bible School want to thank you for your generous response to Great Commission Sunday. With the Lord's help, these funds will help to carry the, great, the good news to many thousands of seekers worldwide. And uh, I'd like to paraphrase or really adapt a couple of passages because I sp think they speak to you. You were enriched in every way, this is 2 Corinthians 9 adapted. You were enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us is producing thanksgivings to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying needs, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. They glorify God because of your obedience to the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution. They long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. And thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You may remember that when Bruce McClarty spoke uh, in preparation for Great Commission Sunday, he mentioned a movie that at that time was, had not yet been um, uh, debuted. And uh, we have now released it. So if you get a chance, go to worldbibleschool.net forward slash trapped, as in caught or stuck, trapped, T-R-A-P-P-E-D. And you'll see the story of Ingrid there. And as you see, uh, and as you meet Ingrid through that movie, uh, just think of her as one example among many examples of the people being reached through your generosity. And I'll adapt one more passage, that's from Philippians 4. Not that we seek the gift itself, but we seek the fruit that increases to your credit. We are well supplied. Your gifts are a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And our God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. 
To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. My spirit is with me, but my flesh is so weak, like the fire.
Let's bow before the Father. God, we give you praise and we give you thanks for all that you are, all that you have done in our lives and all that you will do into the future. Lord, we know that you are the author of life, of light, and of love, and that in all things that you have the glory and that you have the honor. Lord, I, I pray that you be with those who are suffering, who are going through hardships and trials and tribulations, but Lord, I pray that you remind them that you walk beside them and you walk behind them and you walk in front of them. Lord, I ask that in all things that your name might be the one that is glorified. And we thank you for your son and for what he means for us and for the example that he set and I pray that your spirit reminds us of his teachings and that we might be transformed into the image of your son more and more every day. God, fill us with your spirit. Give us love and compassion for one another and bind us together in unity. God, all these things I ask through your son's holy and precious name. Amen. we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's sing together this song, Break My Heart. Break my heart, dear Lord, Several years ago, when Debbie and I were moving into our farm at Center Hill, it felt like I carried a hundred boxes into the house. One box, though, made me stop. It was filled to the brim with pictures of our family and our life together. And so I sat down and looked at that box. I looked at our wedding pictures and saw this skinny guy in a my tuxedo standing beside this beautiful bride. I even remember what I was thinking. Preacher, hurry up before she changes her mind. I looked at the pictures of our babies, and I remembered how wonderful it felt to hold a sleeping baby, to kiss the top of their head and how they smelled. I looked at the pictures of our children playing t-ball and volleyball and soccer and I thought what great kids we've had, how we've been blessed. I looked at the pictures of vacations and Christmas and Thanksgiving and the grandbabies and it reminded me 
of my life in the past and how I've been blessed and the good things that have come apart in my life. That I was loved and that I loved some very wonderful people. You know, that's what a photo album does, though. It takes you back and looks at your life. As we gather around the Supper of the Lord this morning, through the photo album of God's Word, we look back at the old rugged cross where Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And we never quote verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world, that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The story of the cross, and of the sacrifice of Jesus there that we remember in the Lord's Supper is a story of love. I love the words of John. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that he loved us, or that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And you see, that's what we remember in the Supper of the Lord. For almost 2,000 years, it's been the center, I think, of the worship of the church. Sermons are preached and they bless us and then we forget them. Songs are sung and bless us. And then we close the songbooks and go home. But the supper of the Lord is that one wonderful constant that holds us close to Jesus. When I was in college in Harding, the Vietnam War was at its height. I had a friend that had been drafted and he was over there. One day his mother showed me a letter that he had written. And he told her about sitting there in a rice paddy in the mud and the water. And he had hidden a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine. And in that rice paddy, holding his rifle, he stopped and took the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. And then he wrote these words. They can take me away from you, but they can't take me away from the Lord. You see, that's the power of the Lord's Supper. Whether you're quarantined at home, in a shack, somewhere in a storefront church, or gathered here with God's people, the Lord's Supper binds us together. Jesus said it best in his own words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the body of our Lord, for the pain that it endured, for the suffering that it experienced, and for the fact that our Lord was willing to give his body on that old rugged cross that we might live. May we never forget how blessed we are and what he has done for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant that is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we thank you for the blood of our Lord. The fact that he loved us so much that he allowed the life of his body to leave him, to drip into the dusty soil around the cross that we might be forgiven. As you said it so well to John, Unto him who loved us and set us free from our sins by his blood. We give you our thanks, Father, 
that you gave your son and he gave his life and blood for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But as we gather around the supper of the Lord, it's not just the spiritual blessings of the gift of God's Son that we're grateful for. The cattle on a thousand hills are His, and yet He has shared them with us and loved us and blessed us in so many ways. And we stop then and give thanks for the many blessings that we enjoy every day. Father, thank You for blessing us for giving us the food that we eat and the clothes that we wear, the home that we live in, for giving us the blessings of so many that have touched our lives, for a job in which we can earn our living and feed our children, for every good thing, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading this morning will be from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness.
Thank you, Barry. What an excellent job you have done leading us in our worship today. Thank you, brother. I know many of you have seen Lael's post already, and you have expressed your uh, prayerful concern to me, and I know you have to her. That's one of the reasons I'll be gone the next two Sundays. So I appreciate very much that Howard Norton and Jordan Guy, Bill Pratt, who did our communion just a few moments ago, and also Gordon Hogan are going to fill in the pulpit while I'm gone. And while it is a very serious surgery that Lael will be having up in Minnesota, we do feel strongly that the prognosis uh, for her complete recovery is good, but we really do covet uh, your prayers for her and for others who were mentioned this morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Keep your Bibles open to Romans chapter 12. And here's a question. Can a person change? I mean, really change. To change completely the person they are. We're not talking about can they change their preference in home decor or their preference for what type of automobile they like or even their political party. I'm talking about can a person from the inside out can a person really change who they used to be into what they desire to become? I'm talking about genuine, all-encompassing change. From being timid to becoming confident. One who is pessimistic to one who is generally optimistic. A procrastinator into someone who is industrious. From someone who is dishonest into a person who is virtuous and honest. From a person who is perpetually whining and complaining and criticizing to someone who is peaceful and content on the inside. From being a person who is stingy and selfish to someone who can be completely selfless and generous. Can a person truly change who they are? Well, there's three things I want you to know, and you already know this, about real change. Number one, change takes time. None of us like this aspect of change. We want change to be instantaneous. We want at least to have the change to occur by this weekend. Most of us want to be different. We want to change something about us, and we'd like it to happen right now. Those of us who are maybe a little overweight, and we'd like to get through the holidays without gaining weight, we'd like to lose some weight. We don't want it to take months and months and months to Get, to lose the weight that took us weeks and weeks and weeks to gain. Or those of us who may be in over our heads in debt. It didn't seem to take very long to get into this much debt. Why does it take so long to get out of debt? And how many of us have heard the expression, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. We do not want the time it takes for God to truly teach us to be people who are patient. And also, change takes real effort. You see, I would rather someone impose the change on me, especially to make all of the difficult decisions and choices that I need to make in order for change to occur. I would rather someone make all of those decisions for me. I don't want to be responsible for those kinds of things. I do not really want to say yes in those times that my heart wants me to say no. And I don't know that I have the wherewithal to say no when my heart really wants me to say yes. You see, change takes real effort. But more than those two, change takes intentionality. It takes real intention and planning. You don't have change real change that is represented in your life unless you desire it and plan for it and you make decisions based on that. I usually stay about 20 pounds overweight on purpose. I say on purpose because I have never accidentally eaten anything in my life. But to to lose weight, to get in shape, to get your body more healthy, 
You have to plan for it. You probably have to listen to your doctor and do what he or she says, but you have to plan every day the things that you're going to do, the decisions you're going to make or not make in order for the change to really occur. Time, effort, and planning. The same is true for true transformation to occur in the Christian life. God isn't content to just save you from an eternal punishment. He wants to change you. In fact, that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 is all about, that we are being changed from one kind of glory into a better kind of glory. We are being transformed more and more and more into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And God wants to change us from the sinful creatures we were. And He's not just content that we're no longer sinful in that regard. He wants us to be like His Son in the way we act, the way we talk, the way we treat one another. It's called full and complete transformation in our lives. Now, becoming Christ-like doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time. It doesn't happen accidentally. It takes real effort on your part as well. And it takes intentionality. It takes getting into God's Word and using God's Word as your guide to plan how this change and transformation can happen. Now, the problem with all this is, you know, you think, boy, that just sounds really good. Why don't you stop the sermon right here, Noel? Aren't, wouldn't you like that? But the problem is the world is consistently trying to squeeze us into its mold. And to make us what the world wants us to be. And we have a culture all around of us. Uh, around us, We have an evil one all around us. And the culture and Satan, they don't care that you're in church this morning. In fact, it's okay that you're in church. It's okay that you sing your sweet little songs and bow your head and listen to that dry old sermon. It's okay that you worship God, just don't let it change you too much. Don't let it really affect who you become. It's all right that you go through the perfunctory motions of worship. Just don't get all caught up in making Jesus Christ the real Lord of your life. Don't become a fanatic. Oh, you can wear the jersey of your favorite team, and you can buy season tickets, and you can scream and holler and get all kinds of excited about, about something worldly. But if you start doing that about Jesus Christ, we will mock you, and we will ridicule you until you start becoming more like us. See, that's the problem. The world is always trying to mold us in what it wants us to be. And that's the whole point of your faith and your relationship with God this morning. It's to become less like the world and more like Jesus Christ. And Paul encourages us in this in Romans chapter 12 and the first two verses. You know, about presenting your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God, acceptable or pleasing to God. Don't be conformed to this old world, but be transformed. How do you do that? By the renewing of your mind. Let me read verse 2 again from the New Living Translation because I like how it says that part about renewing your mind. Here's what it says. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Watch it now. Changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How do you learn and discern God's will? As I said, you learn it, but you also have to live it. That's how you know what is good and right and acceptable to God. Jesus knew that if he was going to change how we live, he first had to change how we think. 
That's the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount and the way it begins with the Beatitudes. It's all about changing the way you think. Because when we change how we think, we change the decisions that we make. When we change the decisions that we make, we change the person that we become. You see, whoever controls your think process will control the person you become. Whether it's the world that controls your thinking, then controls the mold or the shape of things that occur in your life, or is it God and His Word and His Holy Spirit who changes the way you think and who molds your being to be more like Christ Jesus? There's a battle. There's a battle raging for the heart and soul and the thoughts of every one of us because whoever controls your thoughts shapes your life controls your values, your morals, every living day of your life. So how does the world seek to influence us? Well, the world is continually saying, it's all about you. You are the center of your world. It's all about you. It doesn't matter who you hurt, who you have to step on, because it's really about you and what you want and what you desire. You are the one calling your shots. And it, whatever religion, it's okay that you become religious, but whatever religion you choose, it needs to gr- agree and comply with you. And if you find a, a, a God, if you find a church that disagrees with you, well then go find another God. Go find another church. Because it's really all about you. That's one of the reasons that I had Kent to read all the way through verse 3. Where Paul says, be careful that you do not think too highly of yourself. Because it's not all about you. Now the world would say it is. And the world thinks that that's a great and wonderful philosophy in which to live your life. That it's about me and making me happy. The only major problem with that is when it's all about you, you will never learn what is good and what is acceptable and what is the will of God. When it's all about you, you will never be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. But the world will also close its ears to any parts of the Bible that it does not like. Now the world is quick to quote verses like, now do not judge lest you be judged when it suits its purpose. Or they'll quote verses like, God works in mysterious ways, which isn't even in the Bible. But they like to quote it like it is. You see, the Bible's okay as long as they can twist it and manipulate it to say what they want it to say when they want it to say it. The world ignores and rationalizes away the parts of the Bible it doesn't like and doesn't agree with. And it wants you to do the very same thing with impunity. But all that does is is it excuses and rationalizes the sinfulness that is in your life and mine. You see, when we let the world ignore whatever parts of the Bible it doesn't like, and we agree with that, we basically excuse ourselves for the sins that are in our lives. And if you listen to the world, you will not know God's will, and you will be left in the world's mold. So it's again back to the very premise of this, who is going to control your heart, and your mind, and your thinking. Because whoever is going to control your thinking controls your values, and your ethics, and your perspective. Why is it so challenging to let God's Word shape and mold us? Well, there's a few reasons. We tend to hear a whole lot more of the world's messages than we do God's messages. According to A.C. Nielsen and company, who do the ratings for TV, on average, the average American has 2.4 television sets in their homes. And the average American watches four hours of TV 
every single day. And over the course of 65 years, that person will spend nine years of their life in front of the television set. Now, you couple that with the number of minutes per week, not month, not year, per week, that parents spend in meaningful conversations with their children, they spend three and a half minutes each week in meaningful conversation with their kids. We are allowing the television set to babysit our kids way too much. And I'm not even going to go into the graphic video games and the, and the sinfulness that is permeating social media and the music that's on Spotify, most of all of that is not in accordance with God's will for your life. Most of it's not. I looked at iTunes this morning, and eight out of every ten album that's a new album out has explicit language in it. Eighty percent, and that's just my looking at it this morning. No wonder that even Christians too often are acting like, talking like, dressing like the world. Because they're listening to far more of the world's message than they are to God's message. And the world's message tends to be more palatable, more appealing sometimes than God's message. Because there is a constant barrage of advertisement that is thrown your way and his way and her way. We are, we are inundated with advertising of which most of it says, most of the message is, indulge yourself, splurge, go shopping. It doesn't matter that you can't afford it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Be happy today splurge on yourself on the other hand God's message is discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness and deny yourself take up your cross and follow after Jesus and God's message is be faithful even unto death now you tell me which one of those two messages sounds better sounds more appealing sounds more fun the world has a much more appealing message than god does unless you understand the end result of god's message is eternal life in paradise but the world's message says all that really matters is success and happiness it comes really back to it's all about you and it's about your happiness and about what it takes for you to succeed. Because it's really about you. And so if your spouse doesn't make you happy, then just get rid of him or her and find another one. And if the church isn't meeting all of your special needs, it doesn't matter that you're not all that involved or not in church, but if the church isn't making you happy, go find another church, one that agrees with you more. And the, the message over and over again is as long as you're happy and as long as you feel successful. Well, how do I feel successful? Well, look at my house. Look at my car. Look at how much money I make. But success is not about how much money you make or how new your car is or how big your house is. None of that matters without your God. You see, Calvary changed our definition of happiness and success. And so when you're ready to get rid of your spouse, get rid of your church, because it's all about you, well, God wants me to be happy. No. God wants you to be holy. That's his desire for you. And God's definition of success is called faithfulness righteousness and service you want to be great in the kingdom of God learn to serve 
others. So Paul encourages us, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Or as the New Living Translation said, by changing the way you think. Because changing the way you think means God's work, God's word will help you to think straight and to live right and to walk with your God. But in order for that to happen, it takes some time. And it takes some effort on your part because you're going to have to listen to the Word of God. And you're going to have to trust what it says. And most importantly, you have to live and follow its instructions. So how does God's Word shape our lives and our minds? God's Word teaches you how valuable and loved you are by God. You matter to God. That is why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's why, as John says, we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. It's why Jesus came to live with us, to show us how to think and how to act. And every one of us is far too precious to God for God to leave us alone to squander our lives on the wastefulness of sin. He loves us too much to let us go into darkness and despair. And the cross shows us how much God values you and loves you. And God's Word teaches that there is always healing available for every one of us. It doesn't matter how far away you've gone from God. It doesn't matter how sinful you have become. And it doesn't matter how hurt or wounded you have become by others. If you will turn and look at your God, you will find him with outstretched arms ready to welcome you back. He wants to embrace you again. And Jesus gave us this promise in in Matthew 11 and verse 28 and following. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, you will never find that kind of rest when you are following after this world. When you are allowing the world to squeeze you into its mold. Now you'll find trouble. You'll find heartache. And you will find plenty of despair. But you will not find rest for your soul. On November 15, the SpaceX crew Dragon blasted from Nassau's Kennedy Space Center down in Florida... And its destination was 250 miles above the surface of the earth to the International Space Station. On board that craft was 44-year-old Victor Glover. He's an F-18 carrier pilot, served a few terms uh, or tours in Iraq. He is also the first African-American to spend a long-term mission in space. You might be interested to know that he and his wife attend virtually a couple of Church of Christ congregations down in the Houston area. In fact, his wife, Diana, was raised in our fellowship in the Church of Christ and out in California. Her father is still an elder of the church out there. And she helped to convert him to making Jesus Christ first and Lord of his life. In the Christian Chronicle article that I read, Mr. Glover took with him on board of the craft a Bible. And he also took with him communion. And he's going to use the very strong internet connection that he has on the space station that he is going to continue to worship with the church down in Houston virtually. He is also going to continue giving online all the six months that he is at the space station, 250 miles above the earth. Now here's a man at the peak of his career. He is now doing 
what precious few people ever get to experience. Oh, we all dream about it, but only a few ever get to do it. And, and all eyes are on him and on their crew. And yet here is a man who is not going to allow this world that he's not even living in right now, he's not going to allow this world to control his thinking. He is going to spend every day in the Word of God. And every Lord's Day, he's going to commune at the table of the Lord along with other brothers and sisters. Here's a man that's going to be led and molded by the Holy Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Now, who is shaping the way you think? Who is determining the kind of decisions that you make on a daily basis? Because you are who you are today because of the choices you have made yesterday. And you will be tomorrow based upon the decisions and choices that you will make tomorrow. So who's controlling the way you think? and the way you talk, and the way you act. And if you want to experience change, real, genuine, all-encompassing change, then change the way you think. Think more like Christ. And that change will happen. Can we pray for you? Is there a need that you might have? If you'll call that number, if you'll visit with one of the elders or me after this service, but if you'll call that number, one of us will answer that and we'll talk with you, we'll pray with you. And if you're seeking help, we'll help you to find uh, whatever it is that you need to make the change in your life. If you need to become a child of God, let us know that you're ready to confess your faith and turn away from sin and you're ready to be united with Christ in the waters of baptism. Barry, come lead us in the closing song. And if you need help this morning, please call that number. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the Father, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and still. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, it's been good for us to be here this morning and to be able to worship you and to be encouraged by being with fellow Christians and to hear an encouraging word from Noel. Father, we do indeed want our hearts to be pure in your sight. We want to live our daily lives as Christ did. We pray that you will uh, be with Lael this coming week, toward the end of the week as she has her operation and pray that that will go well that you'll have a complete recovery and will not suffer any ill effects from it. We continue to pray for each member of our congregation. Pray that you will protect them from the virus. Pray that the, those that may catch it will just have mild symptoms. 
I pray that everything that we do will be pleasing in your sight, that you will look into our hearts and forgive us of those things that are amiss. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.